Second. You ready? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Lauren Schoenberg from the National Jazz Museum in Harlem, and I'm thrilled today to be able to have a conversation and to introduce you to Bob Stewart. Now, Bob Stewart is an internationally known musician, band leader, composer, educator, and for even musicians of my generation and younger, a mentor. So he's going to come out and join me here for a long conversation, and then we're going to be able to talk to all of you uh, to see if you have something you'd like to say or a question you'd like to ask, and something tells me uh, that there's a lot that's going to happen today. So in any case, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the great Bob Stewart. All right. Hey, Bob. I'd like to start just by asking you a question that we ask all our interviewees, and hope you don't take it the wrong way. Where and when were you born? Um, I was born in um, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I'll explain that because... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, in uh, 1945. And the reason why, my mother was here in New York at the time, and she went to visit my father, who was in the Army, out in South Dakota. And she got there, and here I come. <laughs> and so therefore, I was born in Sioux Falls, haven't been back since. But. Could, could you tell us a, a bit of background? Could, could you introduce us to your parents? I'm curious about Oh, yeah, them. sure. Please. Matter of fact, part of, he was in the Army at the time out in South Dakota, but he also was in the Negro League. He's, uh, uh, in 1991, he was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame as one of the remaining <coughs> uh, living members of the Negro League from the 40s. Same generation as Buck O'Neill and... Uh, exactly. They were, they were friends. And, and Whitey uh, and uh, Joe Black. And just, as a matter of fact, they were all there when he got inducted in 91. Um, and that was right at the tail, I was right at the tail end of the Negro League in the beginning of when uh, Jackie Robinson was brought into the majors into the Brooklyn Dodgers. And so his, his career tailed off and Jackie Robinson's began around that same time. So. And, and your dad's name was? Riley Stewart. Riley A. Stewart. Right. And he was living in Harlem before he joined the service and went out? Absolutely. He was living in Harlem, up in the Bronx, right up right by Yankee Stadium. Huh. Yeah. And um, at the time, I was living at 116th in Madison, Mount Zion AME Church. That my grandfather used to pastor that church. Oh. Until about 1953. And we moved from then. But we were, we were living in Harlem at that point. Can, can you tell us the story of how the Stewarts came to Harlem? Well, my grandfather's name was Simmons. I was, he was my, my, I lived with my grandparents. It's one of those stories, and I didn't find out until recently. It's very interesting. I mean, I teach jazz history, and part of what I teach is the Great Migration. I'm sure many of you know of what I'm talking about. The movement from south to north, when your parents or their parents left down south and came up here to New York and with Chicago and different, depending on where you left the south from is where you ended up in, in the north. But my whole life, I was understanding that my grandparents, my mother's parents, uh, were from Ohio. And, and in the course of teaching jazz history, I talk about it and I talk about people that moved and all the different reasons why they moved because it was dangerous in the south and so forth and so on. And about 10 years ago, I found out that my parents were from, my grandparents were from Mississippi. Mm. My entire life, my grandfather had passed away. He passed away in 87, 82. And uh, this was 2011. I didn't find out until uh, almost 30 years after, 20, 20, 30 years after he passed that he was from the South. He never once mentioned Mississippi. Now, I'm not sure what that implies, but it, to me it kind of implies the shame, you know, why they had to move, because he had 12 brothers and sisters. And so the whole family lifted up and moved from down south to Ohio. And, and I can but imagine what 
what baggage they carried along with that in terms of uh, why they had to move and the shame of it or whatever of it. Can we talk about your mother for a moment? Could you introduce us to her, please? Uh, the, the, the daughter of Reverend and Mrs. Simmons. Um, and, and her name? Uh, Florence. Florence Simmons. Mm -hmm. uh, she went to, um, I think she, she went to Barnard, I believe. She graduated from the college in the South and then did some master's work at Barnard. Um, and um, she, I, I didn't, she died. She died when I was about five. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Uh, that was here in New York. I mean, I remember, I, vi I can vividly remember being five years old and sitting on what is now, what, what was then and is now Strivers Row. Except in 1952, all those trees were, were about 10 feet high. And I remember sitting in the car when my parents would go to the doctor, and it was just before she passed away. And I remember seeing those trees that we sat in the car. First of all, people wouldn't leave their children in the car now. <laughs> but my brother and I would sit in the car by ourselves waiting for them to come out. And I remember seeing those trees and, and about 30 years later I came back to New York in the 60s and 70s and I went in that block and I thought, man, I've been here before. The only difference was those trees are now like three-story buildings. That they're really tall. So I mean, those are memories that I have of Harlem coming back. One of the things about these interviews uh, is that, you know, the, the particular, the particular let, the specifics, <laughs> the word I was trying to say, um, of a jazz musician's life or of a musician's life or of a teacher's life sometimes seem to be kind of special to most people because they're, they're not artists or they don't participate in that world. But one thing that we get to in this series are the threads mm. and the strands that intersect with everyone everyone, strands and threads that come up. And as we collect these interviews and stuff at the, at the museum, we're kind of creating, hopefully, the picture of a community. And there are picture people, and for all I know, there could be someone in this room who knew your family or who knew the pastor or, or, or who were in that, that thing at that time. And I, and I hope that maybe that's part of what we can uncover. You mentioned a brother. Are you an only? Uh, no, I have two brothers. I had, well, I had two brothers. I, uh, uh, one, Riley, named after my father, um, passed away some years ago. But my younger brother, uh, was about five years younger than me, lives in L.A., down to actually Mission Viejo, south of L.A. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he grew up, one of the, again, one of those stories. I didn't grow up with my younger brother because he was... My, my mother was pregnant with him when she died. Mm. She never came out of the hospital. It's a real drama, right? And so he went down to live with my father's sister, our sister, down in Louisiana. And I, my older brother and I lived in the north with my grandparents. So we grew up our whole life separated. And, and it's just now that we're adults starting to talk to each other and find out about all those times where we were apart. Real situation. Yeah. How was it that music came into your life? I started, um, uh, y'all, I'm not sure what denomination y'all belong to, but we were AME. So every seven years, they would move us. So we spent from like 1947 to 53 here in New York at, at Mount Zion. And in 53, we moved to Newport, Rhode Island and stayed there until 60. And during that time, I saw the Newport Jazz Festival. Mm. I saw Mahalia Jackson stayed at our house and sang at our church. It's, I mean, it's quite an experience. And I got a chance to be a kid in Newport, Rhode Island, riding my bicycle around. I, I did, just going to interrupt. And I have to say, it's the first time I've done, I don't know how many interviews, and when I ask people how did music come into your life, it's the first time someone's ever said, Mahalia Jackson stayed at our house. Right. So, I mean, right. that kind of answers the question. Yeah. My Lord. It was quite an experience, quite an experience. Yeah. And she sang Sunday morning at our church, which was even, even better. Mm. But uh, all that happened while we were in Newport. And while I was in the sixth grade, that's when I, fifth or sixth grade, I started on trumpet. I started playing trumpet in the sixth grade. And I kept playing. By the time I was in the eighth grade, I was given a solo 
in front of the concert band mm -hmm. and, and Newport, and I kept playing. And um, I left Newport in the, uh, after the ninth grade and came to Philadelphia. And, and in Newport, I was the best trumpet player. And it was the best thing that happened to me because I came to Philadelphia, in West Philadelphia, and there were like three trumpet players better than me when you get to the big city. So, I mean, it made me start working again. Um, you know, I haven't mentioned, I don't think I mentioned what instrument Bob plays. Bob is the premier jazz tuba player. Tuba. Tuba, among other things, among the, uh, and so, um, how did that start? How did, how, did, how did the tuba come your way? Or tell the story however you like to, but how did he evolve right. from the treble clef right. to the bass clef? Right. Uh, I was playing trumpet all through high school and two years of college, and uh, I was having embouchure problems. And so they thought it best, because I had to do a graduation recital in about another year, so I switched to a larger mouthpiece and trained myself, and therefore that's how tuba started. Hated it, you know. <laughs> but uh, it wasn't until after that I got my first job at a, at a club called Your Father's Mustache. It's a club where they play Dixieland music, which was one of the few gigs that were available for tuba at the time. In the village? Uh, well, or, or the time I was in Philadelphia. Okay, right, right. And what I did was I stayed there for two years and the second year, I used to come to New York on weekends and play at the club in the village. Right, I remember. I was invited to come and play at that club in the village. So that was my introduction to New York. And so I did that for a whole school year because I was teaching at the same time. I was teaching school in Philadelphia and coming to New York every weekend to play. Well, then could I ask you just to tell us about your higher education, about what happened after high school and how, how you became a teacher and what... Where and how? I have my bachelor's degree from a school in Philadelphia. I think it's called a Philadelphia College of the Performing Arts now. At the time, it was uh, Philadelphia Musical Academy. And I also have a, a master's degree from Columbia Teachers College. No, 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 from, from, uh, from uh, Lehman College. And I have plus 20 credits from Columbia Teachers College. Hmm. So what kind of school were you teaching? Was it high school or grammar or? Uh... No, I was teaching uh, elementary and junior and middle school in, two, in about seven different schools throughout Philadelphia. I would travel. Teaching music or? Teaching instrumental music, right. Ah, okay. Starting kids on instruments. And, and I did that in Philadelphia. And then in 1968, I moved to New York and did the same thing up, up actually up here in Harlem. I was teaching at um, Wadley Middle School. Oh, sure. Yeah. On one, one, uh, 14th. 14th. That's right, between 8th and 7th. Right, yeah. Well, I'm curious about because your name intersects with so many of the most famous names in jazz and the recordings from your duo you have with uh, Ray Anderson to large ensembles to orchestras. Uh, so, up until this point in the interview, which is under teaching school and doing all these things and moving around, but pretty soon your name starts to appear uh, on very, very classic jazz albums and famous groups and things like this. But before we get there, I'd like to ask you about a name that may be obscure to most of you, but about Ray Draper, because he would have been the only, uh, you know, the, the tuba in the music was always, uh, in the earlier forms of jazz, what the bass became and boom, 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 boom. But there was a tuba player in the 1950s, who I believe was a teenager at the time, and he made records with John Coltrane. And uh, his name was Ray Draper, so I'd just like to throw that your way and see how that intersected with your story. Um, I didn't really know so much about Ray Draper. Huh. I was kind of an innocent in a way. I knew I wanted to play the tuba. Right. But I, I mean, I, I had just gotten the... Um, Gil Evans, Sketches of Spain, and, my, and Miles Plus 19, and starting to hear the tuba, and Porgy and Bess, and I started listening to the tuba on those albums. That was my introduction to the tuba, not Bill, through Ray Draper. Right, and Bill Barber was, of course, you know, a greatly respected tuba player from the Claude Thornhill Band, who also played in orchestras, I would think, or <laughs> studio work. So you're coming more right. from that back. Also kind of blue, I mean, um, uh, Birth of the Cool. Right, right. But I didn't know anything about them either. 
I it wasn't until I got to New York and I started to huh. start to play and do do different things. So I I wasn't necessarily using them as my example. Understood. And so when I got to New York, it was kind of refreshing in a way because the things that I was doing was all throughout Harlem, right. playing with Sam Rivers had a rehearsal here, down in Lower Lower Manhattan. Um, there was a band called Collective. It was during that time when, when Black was beautiful, when it just started to be beautiful. And uh, that's right. And um, there was a band down in Lower Manhattan called Collective Black Artists Big Band. Reggie Workman, mm -hmm. Jimmy Owens, a lot of people like that. Right. And so that was my introduction to what the tuba was. Yeah. It wasn't through any, and it was later that I found out about those people. Okay, yeah. Well, th you anticipated my next question, which was the hinge. And by the hinge, I mean, so here you are teaching and doing all these things. And as I mentioned, within a handful of years, you're um, kind of at the summit of the great creative music of that era. Uh, on, again, I'll just recommend you, if you want to go online, those of you who do things like that, just look up Bob Stewart Tuba, and you will see about 5,000 records and things written. Well, it's a fact, because I did it before I came here, <laughs> although I kind of knew it anyway, but I wanted to, to double check it. But my point is, what was the hinge? What was it that took you into that world? Well, again, like I say, I was kind of ignorant and innocent. I just wanted to play. And so I worked this gig, Your Father's Mustache, learning how to play all those Dixieland tunes and getting an understanding of how to move through the chord changes without moving more than a whole step. C, G, C, F, D, G, you know, to figure, that was the, that was the first step. Mm -hmm. And then once I got past that, I started to be creative with it and passing tones and so forth. But I came to New York playing at your father's mustache. Every weekend I would drive in, you know, falling asleep behind my steering wheel, lucky I'm alive. You know, just I was determined to play. I was just determined to be here. So I would teach all week long, and then Friday after school, I'd get in my car right after school and hit the highway to New York to play at the Fosman. And I worked Friday and Saturday nights in New York, and then I would just hang out in New York on Sunday. Eventually, I met Howard Johnson. Ah. Howard Johnson is another amazing tuba player who, um, uh, we met at your father's mustache because like I said, it was the only tuba gig in town. And so he came in to pick up his check one night and he suddenly saw another black tuba player on stage playing. And so that's how we connected and that's the hinge. So was it that he started to call you for subs? Well, he started to introduce me to the fact that there was a gig over here across town with Carla Blay. Who just passed. There was another gig over here with, with, um, with, um, um, uh, uh, tenor sax from um, Har um, Billy Harper? No, he played with Beaver Harris and uh, uh, Archie Shep. Oh. He was working with Archie Shep and he was doing things with Carla Blay. He was also doing things with uh, the Elevens. Right. And so then I started to go to those rehearsals and I, and I went so conscientiously that Gil Evans said, you keep coming here, and he gave me some music to play. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so being conscientious about trying to, it taught me a lesson that if you show up, you might work. Yeah. Right. So I, you know. Well, just one thing I want to make clear to the folks <coughs> listening is when we talk about hinges and things, so you're all of a sudden, I mean, these, these are the people who are playing with Charles Mingus, who are playing with John Coltrane, and all these kind of things. So um, I was intrigued by your comment about innocence and, and all that, uh, because the kind of music that you were playing with them, I, I'm, I'm thinking at that time, couldn't have been more than, couldn't, couldn't have been more different than what was happening at your father's mustache. Because I was actually there as a kid. That was not a very, I'll put it, a very diverse place. No. Uh, it was a certain kind of music, and so, how did you evolve into the Bob Stewart that we all know, the creative artist, uh, taking the tuba out of its functional role and participating as any instrument does? I mean, you're, you're a pioneer in that. Well, it kind of started because uh, when I got the, uh, 
was in the rehearsal band Collective Black Artists. Reggie Workman was the bass player. Um, Buster, Buster Williams was the bass player. Mm -hmm. Charlie Persick was the drummer. Mm -hmm. And so I got a chance to sit up under them and get an understanding about how to play bass lines. Mm -hmm. Just listening to them do that. Mm -hmm. Then I would go home and kind of work on it. Mm -hmm. But that's how that began. You know, and, and I kind of I kind of felt like why isn't the tube of the bass anymore? Mm -hmm. And so and I, as I tried to do it, I got a better understanding of it, why it wasn't. In order to in order to play tuba as the bass, you have to have really strong uh, uh, endurance uh, because when you're asked to play an hour at a time and you don't stop playing, you have to figure out a way to do that. In order to do anything, like you talk, it's athletic. If you talk to athletes about how they do what they do, I think one of the first things they tell you is you have to relax. Because if you don't, you're going to put tension in your muscles. You'll get tired. I'm getting a little too technical now. I'm sorry. No, it's interesting. But this is this is what I had to learn. I had to learn how how to relax, and therefore it started to progress. Mm -hmm. um, and Arthur Blythe called me to play in that ensemble, and that's how it began. So you're playing downtown, different things uh, with the collective black artists, all starting at the, at the uh, your father's mustache. But you mentioned Harlem also. And part of these interviews, because uh, they, they are being recorded, and they are part of the archive of the museum. So sometimes we, we go off on different tangents. Um, what was Harlem going through at that time? Did you live in Harlem? Uh, no, I lived on West 80th Street at the time. Hmm. And I used to come up to Harlem in order to, at the Bethune, I think it is, elementary school, that's where Sam Rivers had his rehearsals. Right. And so I would come up there every Tuesday religiously. Mm. And we rehearsed for two hours, and it was a very different, extremely different music. Right. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a music, it was like a small big band, but instead of the arm harmonies being created this way, all the harmonies were being created because everybody had a different melody. Mm, mm. And thus, the, so, so from one time through the song through the next, the harmony might change. So I learned, I was invited to understand how the tuba could play melodies through that band. Because my part was a melody too. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just like in most big bands during that time where I was replicating the baritone saxophone or the right. bass. Right. It wasn't a, like a creative part. It wasn't until I went to Sam Rivers that I learned how to like how to negotiate melodies and uh, on the tuba, and uh, arrangers like Carla Blay or Gil Evans mm -hmm. who wrote it another kind of way. It wasn't you know. I'd like to ask you about Carla Blay. If it, the New York Times and other places uh, have had her obituary recently, she just passed away, and. You know, a lot has been said about Mingus, a lot has been said about uh, uh, all the names that you mentioned. Even, even Sam Rivers has gotten, seems has started to get his due. But Carla Blay is a figure for most, even, even most jazz people, mm -hmm. I think, that don't really have a handle on exactly what it was and what she represented, it, except those, of course, who love her music and she's known internationally. How would you put, how would you put into words her music? Um, Carla Blay, uh, what's a person that writes mel me a mel a person that writes melodies? Uh -huh. She wrote fantastic melodies. Right. Very, very creative melodies, and um, uh, she was almost like theatrical because many of her things were. She wrote Escalator Over the Hill, which was an opera, mm -hmm. and a lot of her music was kind of. Uh, uh, operatic in a way, hmm. very dramatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, seems like she was way ahead of her time. Like now, there's people who have whole careers based on that kind of thing of writing an opera and doing this, and it's not necessarily four four swing all the time, and and all this. She was she was writing like Maria Shriver, Schneider, 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 Schneider Maria. Maria. Yeah, right, right. Before Maria was doing it, but but different. Right. Right, right. Now, we've talked a lot about your mentors and all these great folks that you came up under. Who were your peers? Did you, did you have any best buddies, people that you played with a lot, that, that were your generation, that were coming up? 
Who would those people be? Arthur Blythe was a primary. I mean, uh, other than tuba players, the tuba players that were in Howard Johnson's right. group, Gravity. Yes. Uh, which would be Joe Daly and Earl McIntyre, both mainstays here in New York. Right. Uh, but Arthur Blythe was, uh, was my primary partner. Can we talk about him for a moment? I remember, um, among other people, Stanley Crouch and, and all these other people writing about him and playing with him, I guess, even at some point. When he came to New York, he was known as Black Arthur Blythe. Mm. And he played the saxophone, well, you can put it into words, but just as I received it, in a way that most people weren't playing, it was like fire, or it was, it was so strong. Um, Besides the tonalities, the sound. Yeah. Arthur had a very unique sound. I mean, you would not mistake him for anybody. Right. And there's very few people now that sound like that. Um, Steve Williams kind of sounds like that. Mm -hmm. uh, he kind of has that Arthur sound, but not really, but mm. he has a, a version of it. Right. Uh, but that was his thing, was his sound. But, and then he had a whole other harmonic system that he improvised on. Hmm. So it didn't sound like regular alto saxophone right. playing bebop changes or something. Right. You know. The music that you're playing with Reggie and, and all these people that you talked about, it seems as though, but well, doesn't seem as though, it was connected to the times. It seemed, it, and it was connected to what was happening politically, what was happening socially. I mean, culturally. And now it almost seems as though so much of jazz... I don't know, it seems to be um, something that people say you should know about from the past and uh, mm. what these people did and all this kind of stuff. Not to say that there is an incredible music happening. There is. But when I think of those bands that you were in, they seem very, very much part of what was happening, doing something new that hadn't happened before and kind of making a statement about it. Is that a fair comment? I, I think so, but by the time I got there, it had already the thing had already happened for two generations before me. If you think about uh, Ornette Coleman in 1960 and with free jazz, right. um, that was kind of the first generation of it. Mm -hmm. And, and by, the time, by the time I started playing was the mid 70s, that was 60, you, right. 16 years later was the mid 70s. Right. And suddenly it was more, it wasn't so harsh for the ear. Right. And so I got a chance to join in when when it had some uh, um, uh, maturation time, uh, it had a chance to mature. Yeah, and and so, uh, and what happened? There was a whole culture built around that period. Uh, in the, down what is now called Soho, uh, was abandoned in the early in the middle seventies. It was totally abandoned. So a lot of that music happened down there, and Europe gave it a name, it was called Loft Jazz. And they built multiple uh, jazz festivals over in Europe on Loft Jazz. And so therefore all those musicians not only got a chance to play through there and then through right. the public theater, they also were invited to Europe to do any number of tours and concert series over in Europe based on Loft Jazz festivals in Europe. Studio Rivby and right. Alley's Alley and and all those clubs. But again, it had a, had a generation to mature, and then when it finally happened for the second time, right. the audience was larger. Now, but, but you, yes, and you mentioned Europe and giving it a name and turning it into something not only saleable, mm. but something that it wasn't going to have here. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that, about, I'll just venture over here and take it or leave it, but... Um, the word jazz itself, the connection of the music itself to the community from which it came, and the fact that, the fact that by the time of the music that we're talking about here, um, it was kind of removed from a certain kind of functionality that the earlier music had in terms of people dancing to it or people singing the songs and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I just mentioned that in terms of your comment about in Europe it became something, that they could come over here and either name something 
or turn it into something that maybe here it didn't have. But in Europe, you make a lot of money touring and making records and your pictures on the cover of a magazine and people are interviewing you. And, but in America, the music wasn't received like that. Is there anything there? Uh, well, it was, I mean, it was interesting that where you get that kind of recognition when you're suddenly in Europe, whereas big promoters like George Ween here in the United States were calling that downtown music. They were, they were creating the separation. Yes. They were calling it this music that exists way over there. It doesn't really exist in our world of jazz right here. And they were making that separation when they shouldn't have. They lost, they missed the bet because they were, they were, they were these are people that make money during this. Right. And they didn't really understand how they could possibly make money off of that. Mm. Had they, they would have included it some kind of way because it would have nurtured the jazz community. Yeah. Had, they, had they introduced one artist at a time during a festival, put another artist over here during another one of their festivals, mm -hmm. they would have introduced that music to the world. Yes. And it would have been theirs. Mm -hmm. But instead, they called it that music over there mm -hmm. and sent it downtown, and they didn't really claim it. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think he missed a bet, for mm -hmm. sure. But it has since claimed its own. You know, water will rise to its own level, won't it? And that's what's happened. A lot of those musicians are doing. I'll give you. I'll give you a financial example of what I'm talking about. Um, in the '80s, uh, I was touring a lot. I mean, every year I'd be going to Europe maybe six or seven times to travel two or three, two or three weeks at a time with different bands from like uh, Dizzy Gillespie to McCoy Tyner to Arthur Blythe to Carla Blay to Charlie Hayden. I was traveling a lot. Now, talking about finance now. Uh, in the 80s, I decided I wanted to buy a co-op. Now, you know you can't go to the bank and get a loan, right? Now, because I had been working so much at these Dolph Jazz Festivals in Europe, they wanted to see my tax returns for the last five years. And because I had been working all these festivals in Europe, these Dolph Jazz Festivals that George Ween wanted to ignore, I went to the bank, yes, Mr. Stewart, we'll give you some money. <laughs> all right, that's what George Ween missed out on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just, I'm just a little guy playing tuba. And I was able to go to the bank and get a loan in order to buy a co-op. Now just imagine what he could have bought had he had, had, he had corralled all these musicians mm -hmm. and put them out there on his stage. He'd have more paintings in his apartment, right? right. <laughs> I understand. I mean, that's, and that's, that's a really an abstract thing I'm bringing in to the money that the United States lost, the promoters in the United States lost and in terms of not in, not in, not in involving the loft jazz in their repertoire. Right. Well, that's one of the important things about these interviews and about what we're talking about. It's not just music. It's music in the larger context. So I have a question for you. Um, by the time I came to town in the mid-70s and then into the 80s and all that, uh, you had such a reputation uh, as a teacher and as a mentor and all those things. And how did, how did you maintain your teaching through all these things? And uh, um, uh, We haven't really talked about that. The whole time that I was doing this, I was teaching school. Right. I had, uh, and when I came to New York in 1968, I taught at 114th Street. And then I left, I left teaching for about a year. I went out on the road with this blues singer called Taj Mahal. Oh, wow. And we went all the way out to the West Coast, the Fillmore East, the Fillmore West, all of it down the West Coast and played. And that was from January of 71 until January of 72. And I stopped teaching for that year. And in 72, I came back to teaching to, um, where did I come back to? I came back to a, a junior high school, intermediate school on 93rd Street. Um, and, and started teaching, but I still kept playing and touring. Maybe not so often, but um, what allowed me to do it, I was teaching through that whole time, and, and I had a jazz doctor. Explain. 
I had a doctor that, that uh, whenever I had a two-week tour, he would provide me with a letter that said I needed bed rest. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was able to go out on tour and the and I had to, I covered the Board of Education. I gave right. a letter. Need rest. And I came back and I do my job really well, put on a big concert. It was a fabulous concert and they enjoyed it and loved it. Oh, Mr. Stewart, do you feel better? I say, I'm okay. <laughs> I'll be all right. <laughs> so that's part of the way I did it. And then as it evolved by, um, uh, when I taught from then all the way up through uh, 2000, and where were you teaching at that point? I was, I, I, I had uh, moved from, um, I took a leave of absence in 1983 for 10 years. And that was the time when I was playing full time and traveling in Europe. And that's when I got that loan. I went to the bank and got the loan, but I took a leave of absence uh, for, um, this is, and this is interesting to, to all the things that intersect we talked about you know, tuba and getting a loan and things that you know George Ween missed out on by not George Ween. Right. Uh, we and, and what happened during this time is um, I took a leave of absence and I was able to take advantage of women's lib started happening by the mid late 80s and you know women's rights and so I said well okay. Then I can get a leave of absence as a, as a, uh, I can get a, what's it called when you're about to have a child? Maternity. Pregnant. Right. I got a maternity leave. I don't get it. Well, I had to, it doesn't say you have to have a baby. It says you have to care for a baby. I had to care for a baby. My son, who is now 37, was born in 1986. And so I had to care for a baby. So I took a second five-year leave, a maternity leave. Paternity leave. Paternity, excuse me, thank you. <laughs> I wasn't pregnant. Unless there's something I don't know. No, no. <laughs> okay. Right. okay. So I took a leave of absence, and again, right. the culture intersected my life. Yes, but you wound up teaching at a wonderful school. Right, and I, and I became the, um, in 93 I came back to teaching, and I became the head of the jazz department at LaGuardia High School of Performing Arts. Which, which is right down here below, before behind Lincoln Center. So I taught there for about 10 years. And, and during that time, Jazz at Lincoln Center began to flourish. And they created a, a, a big uh, competition uh, called the, essentially Ellington. And they invited high schools all around the country to come submit tapes and participate in the competition. So the, it started in 96 and for the first two or three years, my band won first place. I remember, I was a judge. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, 96, we won first, we came in second place the next year. And I think they were too embarrassed to give it to me two years in a row. So, <laughs> so, so I came in second place and then, but the program is still continues and their band, great bands performing now, it's amazing. Well, I, I have to mention, because you're, you're too modest to mention it, but uh, specifically, so many young musicians came out of that school where you were in charge of the jazz department during that decade, or however how, how, how many long years it was. Uh, I mean, just an incredible amount of young talent that you nurtured, and it's just a lovely chance now uh, to give you props for that, because I think a lot of people know Bob Stewart, the jazz tuba player and composer, arranger, band leader, and all that. But as an educator, when you mention it to musicians of that generation, uh, can we give Bob a round of applause for that? <laughs> well, that's just a, a facet of what you've done that, that, that deserves so much credit. Um, we're going to get to a point here pretty soon uh, for some questions and or answers or statements or just something that you'd like to say to Mr. Stewart. And I just have to make a, a brief comment that, as you can probably tell, I could talk to this man for six hours. There's so much there. And what we're doing right now is just kind of flying over it in the amount of time that we have. And that's why I'm going to be curious to hear about maybe some of your questions and things that we haven't gotten to. But let me ask you just to, to zoom away from there for a moment um, to ask an impossible question. Where's jazz going? Um, what is its future? And I know that there's really 
there may be no answer, but what do you think about it? What do you think about uh, the fact that uh, so few people admit that they listen to it? I don't, I, I don't know about that part. I know I see, I see all the young musicians, like you mentioned. Uh, there's um, students that I had the privilege to interact with. One is, a, is the primary bassist with Jazz and Lincoln Center. He's, uh, he graduated from uh, LaGuardia High School of Performing Arts, and now he's been in Lincoln Center. How many years has Carlos been there? Carlos Enriquez, and, and also, Band leader, composer, prime mover in in, in Afro Cuban music. Uh, mm. No, he's he's okay. brilliant. Right, he's been there for 10, 15 years. Right, now, he was he's this little kid from the Bronx, you know. The, the, he had, uh, he had uh, uh, his mama had to you know hustle to get him lessons, and he got lessons from some of the Latin all stars all up in the Bronx and stuff. Came to LaGuardia and played, and uh, no sooner than he graduated from LaGuardia. Went Marcellus snapped him, him right up because <laughs> he was he saw the brilliance in this young man. Yeah. Matter of fact, there's at least there's at least uh, two or three other people. The, one of the tenor saxophones in the band mm -hmm. went to not, not the he's I don't think he's he's in and out now. Walter Walter Brand Blanding yes he was went to Laguardia as well as um, Camille Thurman. Mm -hmm. She was she was. She was there just before I left. Yeah. She, yeah. Was, she came to me one year. Camille Thurman's this young lady that plays tennis saxophone and sings. And sings. If you haven't got a chance to hear her, Camille Thurman. Camille, beautiful young lady, plays tenor, and she's got a gorgeous voice. But if you've got a chance to see her, see her anywhere, just you know, turn the radio on or however it happens to be. Yeah. But uh, she now is premiere with the, with the ensemble. Yeah. There's a young lady that, you may not oh, oh. hear this from Jazz and Lincoln Center, but there's a young lady named Lakeisha Benjamin. Oh, she's blowing up big now. She was my lead alto player when she was at LaGuardia. She's in the pop world, huge. I mean, she goes to all the, the Arab countries being featured as featured artists. Enormous. If you go on Facebook, just type in Lakeisha Benjamin. Can I use your mic for a second? Yes. Mine's dead. I just want to mention that Lakeisha Benjamin, and I just saw this last week, she was just with Herbie Hancock and all these people and Quincy Jones, and they put their arms around her. Right. She's enormous. So she's about to blow up, as they say, uh, and de deservedly so. I want to ask you one more question just at, at, at the end of this segment. Could you talk just a moment about your own projects? And I know there's a lot of them. One of them that I'm particularly fond of is the duo with you and Ray Anderson on trombone, brass. Uh, heavy metal. Heavy metal. Uh, it's unlike anything you've ever heard. It's a tuba and a trombone, and it sounds like a 50-piece orchestra. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Could you talk about that for a moment? Um, yeah, Ray Anderson and I go back a long way. As a matter of fact, I just, I just put online today a, 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 an album not a cover, but the, you know where the album folds out? There's a whole picture inside with Carla Blay who just passed away. And, uh, mm. and he was in the band during part of that time. Right. He and I do a duo called Heavy Metal. And we play Ellington, we play our own compositions, and we do them in a particular way that right now, even more currently, I have a duo that I do with my son, ah. whose name is Curtis Stewart. And if you if you were to go online and type in Curtis Stewart, Grammys, Grammy performance. He's a violinist. Two years ago, he did a solo, uh, Isn't She Lovely? Stevie Wonder's Isn't She Lovely? She did it at the, he did it at the Grammys to a standing ovation. Mm. But like I say, if you go online, go online and type in Curtis Stewart, Grammy performance, ah. and it will come up. And you'll see just this, standing on that stage, all by himself, playing Isn't She Lovely. Oh, I saw minutes. that, but I, I didn't know it was, it was your son. That's my son, right. -E. It's a monster. S-T-E. S-T-E-W-A-R-T. Stu Art. <laughs> right. Uh, but he did a Grammy performance two years ago that was a knockout. Yeah. 
Well, th this concludes the, the interview part of our segment. And again, I'll just say one more time, I think we could all sit here for a good six hours. There's so much we haven't even touched upon, but hopefully we'll have a chance to do that. But we'd like to open it up if there's any questions, comments, or it doesn't have to be a question or a comment, just a statement. And I see a, a gentleman in the back. Yes, sir. I'm going to repeat the question. The question was, during your time at Jazz Lincoln Center, did you cross paths with the legendary Phil Schapp? Um, I knew him before, even before that, because I used to go up to... Um, KCR? West End Bar. Oh, the West End. The West End Bar, when he would uh, have his programs up there, and that's where I first met him. Right. And I also went on his program across the street at KCR, WKCR and he interviewed me a couple of times. Um, so I got a chance to meet him. He's a great, great gentleman. Yes, sir. Yeah. Lawrence, yes it is. Yes it is. Tell me your name, please. Tell me your name. My name is Wes Johnson. Pleasure, Wes. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, my question is, did I hear you say Maria Shriver did Melody? Oh, Mar Maria Schneider. 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 Not She's sure. a big okay. band arranger. Yeah. Okay. And, and Carla Blay was doing melodies similar to what Maria... The question was about uh, Maria Schneider, and I understand about Shriver, <laughs> uh, which would be a different story. Oh, right. <laughs> right. 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 But we were talking about person. Maria Schneider, and Bob was talking about her relation to no. Carla Blay and how she was doing it long before. Questions, comments, anyone? Yes, ma'am. Right hey. I'm an alum of music and art. Yes. And I want to know how you were received when you became a faculty person because there were no African-American faculty, there was no jazz department, there was nothing. When were you at Music and Art? When it was up on the hill? Yes. What 1967 year? is my graduation year. Uh -huh. So I think right after that, Justin DeChocho. Can you repeat the question for the folks? Uh, the question was um, my experience at Music and Art. And, and, and this, this, this lady had said that she was a graduate of Music and Art when it was up on up by 135th Street near Amsterdam when it was up on the hill. Um, um, it changed. It changed. The first, one of the first changes was um, Justin DeChocho, who is not black, but he created the jazz, he helped to create the jazz along with, um, along with uh, the Gabriel Kosakoff. You remember that name? Yes, I do. He was the head of the department when it was up there. And uh, between the two of them, they created a, the first jazz program. And, and subsequently after, that's how I got the job. At LaGuardia. At LaGuardia, right. He, he retired, not he didn't retire, he was invited to come up to Manhattan School of Music to teach. And, and, and this is again, the late 80s, when I'm in the middle of traveling, I came off the road and I went to LaGuardia in 1987 and said, listen, I've got, I've got at least, I gotta get 10 more years. I wanna get 25 years to be able to retire. I had 15 at the time. And so I went, thinking ahead, I went there six years early in 87 and I auditioned for the job when he wasn't leaving yet. And so I conducted everything and they saw that I could do the job and I left there and went right back out on the road again. And in 19, 1993, I got a call while I was in Europe I was in Europe for like two months traveling and from Gabriel Kosakoff and he says, you ready to come back to teaching? Because that's when Justin DeChocha was invited to go to Manhattan School. So by September of 93, I came back and started teaching at LaGuardia. I remember, I remember that. That's how I got there. Thank you. And there are lots of people of color there, uh, you know, many, many people of color there teaching all kinds of Ethnic groups were there then, by that time. Very good. I'm glad they changed. What were you, a singer? Or what were you? A singer, yes. Okay. And you may know my very good friend,
Priscilla Baskerville. Oh, the, there was a whole family of uh, musicians the Baskervilles. Yes. Right? yes. I know that name for sure. And I know you know the person who wrote the opera. That's the first African-American person to write an opera for the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, uh, Terrence Blanchard? Yes. Yes. He's, I, I, um, I first met him when he was about 20. I was on tour with Dizzy Gillespie in, um, in Europe. And that was when he first came on the, a matter of fact, it was when, uh, when Mitt Marcellus and his brother first came on the scene. And they were, they were traveling in their quintet, and Terrence Blanchard, Donald Harrison quintet was also traveling. And we all were in Matarao, Japan. And the, those two bands, and I was with Dizzy Gillespie's big band, were there, and they were like these young guys just out of New Orleans, 20 something, yeah. and they were just getting started. And that's when I first, I first saw them and met them. And did you know Jerry Gonzalez? Who? Jerry. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely, trumpet player. Yes. And his brother Andy. Yes, they, he was my year. I loved Jerry. Really? Far Jerry, out. Jerry was talking about preserving music back in the 60s. Wow. I didn't know what he was talking about, <laughs> but I learned. Right. No, Jerry, they were both uh, uh, very important people in the movement of uh, not just Latin jazz, but music generally. Because Jerry, Jerry and Manny, Jerry and Andy both worked with this band called Manny Oquendo's mm -hmm. Conjunto Libre. They worked in that band. I had a chance to sit in with that band one time. And that's just like, it's a cultural experience. Yeah. Can I have the mic? Both of them. Both of them. His brother Andy on bass is legendary. Just super knowledgeable. Historian. Have, have another question over here. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I appreciate you. you. Indeed. It's such a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Stewart. Oh, I know you. <laughs> I, know you. <laughs> I, I, I have a question for you. I heard you mention that you taught school in many of the places, mainly downtown. Did you t ever teach uh, in the Harlem community at any of the school? Uh, the question is, did I teach in any of the, I taught downtown, but I teach in the Harlem community. I did at 114th Street. Wadley. The Wadley, Wadley. Um, Intermediate School. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I taught there from, um, I taught there from, uh, like uh, when I first came into the city in 1968 until 70-something. Um, I was there for a while, until 71. Is it a private school or a charter school? Or no? I'm not sure what it is, but they have, no. it, there's multi, there's many different, there's, there's two or three different schools in the school. In the Wadley, yeah. I'm not sure what they call that now, but they started doing that where they have multiple, like, and when I taught at the school on 93rd Street, they had an environmental cluster. They had a, uh, a, a, a multilingual cluster. They had a scientific cluster. You know, my, um, my, one of my great grandchildren plays the, some, the little tuba. The, what is that? Baritone horn? No, symphonia or something. Oh, okay. Sousaphone. What is it? Sousaphone? No, it's a symphony or something hmm. like that. It's named the little tuba. Too much. Really? So people will be yes. excited to know yes. that I talk with you. How do, why do I know you? I don't know. Tell me your I'm name. I'm all over the place. Mm -hmm. You knew the honeys and the bands. Uh -huh. Rashida uh -huh. Ali is my name. Rashida Ali. Rashida Ali. It's a pleasure. Pleasure. And I formerly was... A singer, opera singer. Oh, okay. When I first came to New York in '67. Wow. So you might have seen some of those travels. I'm sure. I, I know. I, I know your face. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm not sure we've done it, but no, thank no. you. Can we thank Mr. Stewart again? There's one more question here. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. What made you become interested in playing music? And how long have you been playing music? 
That's a great question. What made you interested in playing music, and how long have you been playing music? Um, <clears throat> well, um, how, how long? Oh, good after this. How long? I started when I was uh, in the uh, fifth grade. And that was in 1956. And it was trumpet at the time. Now, the show, you know how they talk about, the, what's the, what, are the, what are the scholastic tests called? The, SAT? The SATs and all these. And you know how they, they talk about how these tests are, are kind of uh, biased yes. in a certain kind of way? Yes. I can't speak to that, but when I was given the test to take music, now, I'm used to being in church, you hear an organ, you hear piano, you hear people singing. Well, they came and gave us a test with this electronic instrument. And it made this sound that, you know, didn't feel that comfortable to me. And they would play two notes. And they say, well, tell me which note is higher. Right. And they play the two notes. And it's, after a while, those notes started to sound the same to me. You know, those electronic sounds. I wasn't used to it as a little fifth grader. I'm a country boy. I didn't know, you know. And so I failed the test. And so the, the, the music teacher up there, he said, well, anybody that didn't score such and so in your test, go back to your room, please. I didn't go. That's how I started playing music. Mm, mm. I didn't go, I stayed. You know? And I didn't know anything about unfair tests and all that. I know I wanted to do it, and I wanted to do it bad enough, I lied. I told him, yeah, I passed it. That's how I started. <laughs> and that was the same thing that made me, made me lie and tell him that, you know, yeah, I passed your test. That's the determination I've had my whole life. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. So you had, a, you, had a lot of, you had a lot of formal training in your earlier years in terms of your music career. Am I correct? Not a lot. I just had you know, local, local, like local trumpet teachers giving me lessons, and most of them had a grudge against somebody or another. So they were, you know. Did you learn how to play music? Uh, I, read music. Yeah, sure, absolutely, absolutely. One more time for Bob Stewart, and thank you all for being such a lovely audience. Let me add just a little bit more there. Mr. Stewart, thank you so much for being My pleasure. here. My pleasure. If there's a future day that you want to be here as a speaker, a musician, a friend and neighbor, or any other way, you would be so welcome. Oh, absolutely. We would yeah. love it. Be thank, glad to come. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Schoenberg in the National Jazz Museum, okay. you've brought a number of things here. They've been just wonderful. Thank you. And they've really meant a lot to people here in any ways that we can help move that forward as a mutual relationship. We'd love to do it. So thanks also very much to the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the afternoon. Yes, sir. Thank oh, you. Man, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Excuse my seat. Richard. It's a pleasure, Bob Stewart. Hi. Nice.